let me start with a little bit of uh, inspiration, sort of in addition to Joseph Albers. This is a picture of Honora O'Neill. She's a philosopher at the Cambridge University. And she gave this absolutely remarkable series of lectures on BBC radio um, in, back in 2002. And you can actually still hear these lectures online. Uh, she was talking about the public sector in the UK um, and looking at sort of the decline of public trust in the public sector. And when you listen to and read her speeches, she could just as well be talking about the nonprofit sector, philanthropy, civil society. Um, and let me just pull up one quote from one of her lectures here. Um, you know, she says quite provocatively that we will need to give up childish fantasies that we can have total guarantees of others' performance. We'll need to free professionals to serve the public. We'll need to work towards more intelligent forms of accountability. What she's referring to, to give you a bit of context, is a concern that at the time in the public sector, she was observing uh, four purposes of public accountability, a move towards co a compliance orientation. So lots more procedures, for example, for doctors when they see patients, um, lots more procedures for police to fill out reports, a lot more procedures for teachers in the public education system um, to pay attention to standardized testing. And all of those things in and of themselves are not necessarily a bad thing, but she saw a dark side to this accountability where she was worried that the emphasis on compliance and procedure might mask or crowd out um, forms of accountability that could actually help improve performance. And so what she was calling for, what she called sort of more intelligent forms of accountability was, was what I interpreted as forms of accountability and measurement that could be useful for strategy, for decision-making inside organizations um, by managers and leaders. And that became part of the motivation for this book as I ended up spending a lot of time with leaders of nonprofits, of social enterprises, um, both in executive education as well as in graduate courses. And these questions always of, well, what should I measure? But how can I do that in a way that's actually useful to decision making? Which I know is a question that's very close to the heart of most of you on this call. So what I propose to do in the next half hour or so is A, to just kind of lay out some fundamentals so that we're all on the same page in terms of language. And then what I'd like to do is to lay out four types of strategies. So that two by two, the Joseph Albers two by two, there's four key strategies that I wanna lay out that I think are essential um, choices that leaders of social change organizations must make. And then I'm gonna focus on one of the four strategies, um, an ecosystem strategy. And then time permitting, um, I'll put up some resources, but otherwise we can share those with you after, um, after the webinar. So fundamentals. Um, you know, there's essentially three core questions, I think, that, um, that are essential to strategy that any manager is constantly asking. And the questions will not surprise you, I think, but it turns out that the answers to them are more complicated to arrive at um, than the questions would indicate at face value. So the first is obviously this question of what do we seek to achieve? Um, and to draw on a different philosopher, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, he is supposed to have said that the most common form of human stupidity is forgetting what we were trying to accomplish. Um, so we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day that we lose sight of sort of the longer-term goals of our efforts. And in the language of strategy, this is, uh, this is kind of captured by the value proposition, which requires a specification of, well, what are the needs and who are the clients? And can one actually identify this market or this beneficiary sets of communities um, in highly specific terms, as well as trying to size the scale of the challenge and uh, that client group? The follow-on question is, uh, of course, how will you do that? How will one deliver that kind of change? Which again, sort of in the language of strategy, is the social change model. And here is sort of all of the tools that are familiar, I think, uh, 
uh, to evaluators, theories of change, logic models, which sort of on the business side people refer to as value chains. Um, but we're seeing increasing attention to other aspects of social change models here, such as a system framing. So lots of new work on how does one actually map the system within which one operates so that you understand your positioning within that larger ecosystem um, and how what might be the levers for change within that. And then in addition, there's increasing attention to the alignment of a social change model with the business model. So the social change model being sort of bringing about social change and the business model meaning how do you actually raise the revenue to actually be able to do this? And are those two things sometimes in tension or in conflict? You know, is how you raise money in conflict with how you actually spend it? In any case, to make a long story short, these four components are what we're seeing as uh, quite essential to a social change model as one set of strategy questions. And then this leads to that third critical question of how will we hold our feet to the fire, which is an accountability question. And you'll notice that the two sub questions there of accountability for what and accountability to whom map on directly to the questions in the value proposition, making this a virtuous circle of sorts. As I wrote this book, these questions, I framed them with the manager, with the leader inside a social change organization in mind, rather than from the perspective of the external evaluator, external funders. I framed them from the perspective of what is it that the agent of change is actually looking for, the organization of change. Um, so three fundamental questions of strategy. Um, and I wanna kind of pick up on one aspect of the social change model, which will be familiar, I think, to everybody, uh, the logic model developed in the 1960s. I want to say two things about it, um, you know, without going into, into sort of the, the components, since that'll be familiar terrain for you. The two things I want to say are, if we were to put a box around the logic model, that dashed line running down the middle kind of separates what the organization has control over, that's the left-hand side, um, and what you have decreasing control over, um, the environment, what actually happens in society as one launches an intervention or a set of activities. Um, and so managers are always concerned about what do I actually have control over? So this issue of control needs to somehow factor into the decision-making calculus of a manager, as well as what they reasonably feel they can take credit for in terms of actual performance, in terms of actual results. Um, the second aspect of this is, well, to what degree um, do we actually understand cause and effect in this chain, right? So the common critique that the logic model is too linear, that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater, it can be quite useful, but recognizing that as we move into sort of less certain cause effect models, high uncertainty about cause and effect, um, the linearity of this breaks down. And so this perennial question of what to measure um, in the hundreds of executives that I've taught in um, exec ed programs, this question just constantly comes up. So the, the Cliff's Notes version of this um, is, well, it depends on your strategy. And so can we develop a way of thinking about strategy that helps managers clarify different types of strategies that they might choose from. And where I'm gonna go next is the two by two, uh, which articulates two contingencies that strategy is dependent on. The first is this uncertainty about cause and effect. And the second is the degree to which one actually has control um, over outcomes. And this varies considerably as you well know. So this leads to four primary ideal type strategies and what you measure follows from that. Um, part of this project also aims to, to push back on the normative view that any social change organization should always measure outcomes, sort of as far down that logic chain as possible. Is it possible that in certain conditions, measuring outputs, short-term results is perfectly adequate? and perhaps even desirable 
from a resource constraint perspective? And if so, what might those conditions be? And then the corollary to that is what are the conditions under which it's incumbent to measure long-term outcomes, not just for individuals, but for society as a whole. So these are the contingencies that I want to explore. So let me put up four pictures of different types of interventions. So here's an ambulance service that I looked at in India, and I devote a chapter to this ambulance service. It's an emergency response service, and we kind of are all familiar with this kind of a service. Here's a picture of an organization in Washington, D.C. that serves the homeless. And you can see their dining room in the background of this picture and the case management workers uh, in the front. Um, what is it about this kind of work uh, that is strategically related to that ambulance service or maybe strategically quite different? Here's a photograph I took a couple of years ago of a rural development organization in Western India. Its focus is on agriculture and natural resource management. It works with farmers through an entire chain of services from agricultural credit and supplies to irrigation to getting goods to market. How is this strategically similar or different? Um, and then finally, here's an advocacy organization or actually a collective of advocacy organizations working with waste pickers around the world. So these are people that you know, in India, in Brazil, in South Africa, and increasingly in North America, pick up recyclable materials from dump sites, from households, and actually channel them into the economy um, as productive items. And so there's advocacy groups fighting for their rights, um, for social protections for them. What is it that these different kinds of enterprises actually share strategically, and how are they strategically distinct? I devote a chapter to each of these because I think they're um, distinct in terms of their strategies, but they're also symbolic for a whole wide range of strategies that I'm gonna articulate for you now. So those four pictures kind of map onto this two by two. And you'll see on the vertical axis um, is uncertainty about cause and effect. So how well do we understand cause and effect in the interventions that we're looking at? What is the state of knowledge on that? and it varies from low to high. On the horizontal axis, we've got control over outcomes. So even where we understand cause and effect quite well, there will be instances where the organizations implementing activities related to that cause effect chain will have control over only a slice of that chain. So they might have limited control as compared to high control. So that's the, the, the the dimensions of the two by two. So let me begin filling this out. So the first, um, the bottom left quadrant, is what I call a niche strategy. The orange arrow depicts activities. What is it that the organization is doing? Um, in a niche strategy, there's a very highly focused, limited set of activities. So think about that ambulance service. Um, you know, what they're doing is they're responding to 911 calls and they're uh, administering emergency care and then transporting the patient to the hospital. And then there's a handoff to the next, next niche within that ecosystem, which is the emergency room. And then you can imagine subsequent niches. That, that orange circle is what they deliver. It's a short-term output. And it can be measured in terms of response time. Most ambulance services focus in on that. And so if you were to ask, Sikitsa Healthcare Limited, which is the ambulance service in India that I studied, or the London Ambulance Service, or the New York Ambulance Service, they would all say, one of our most important indicators is response time. How quickly do we respond and administer emergency care? And we know that for instances of cardiac events, that responding within nine to 12 minutes has a great effect on patient survival. But we don't actually measure patient survival we measure the output of response time. Uh, so they actually focus on measuring outputs. And you can imagine all sorts of emergency services, as well as others, where this is quite a suitable set of metrics. On the other hand, you could have um, a good understanding of cause and effect, where you've got sort of this whole series of activities that are lined up, depicted by that sequence of arrows. 
and each arrow is an activity that delivers an output. So think here about that agricultural development organization. The first arrow is their supply of credit so farmers can buy seeds and fertilizers. You can measure the outputs. Are people getting sort of adequate credit and supply of this material? The second arrow might be farmer-based training, irrigation services, land and water conservation. And the third arrow might be getting good to markets. That potentially, as an aggregate, leads to a set of outcomes, which is that open orange circle. Um, increases in household and farm incomes, reduced migration from rural to urban areas in the off season and so on. And so here we can actually begin through an integrated strategy to actually not just measure outputs at each stage, but actually the, those components add up to more than the sum of the parts. We can actually get to outcomes. So what happens up here? In an emergent strategy, we're looking at instances where the understanding of cause and effect is pretty limited. So our logic models have lots of assumptions in them. Our theories of change are filled with hypotheses for which we're not really sure about the evidence. The challenge for organizations in this space, and I think a lot of policy advocacy work falls into this. And, um, you know, and I want to point to Julia um, and Tanya's work on sort of looking at different types of advocacy models, um, as well as a piece that they did where they identified types of interim outcomes um, for advocacy uh, that was very useful for, for me in thinking about this quadrant, where I think any organization, as far as they can go, they can reasonably measure their influence which is a set of interim outcomes. So it might be influence on policymakers, on legislators. It might be influence on some other set of experts who then influence policy. Um, the reason why I've sort of got this circular, um, sort of constant looping um, uh, visualization here is in studying such organizations, it seems to me that what they do well is they have an end goal in mind, which is that interim outcome depicted by the filled circle surrounded by the open circle, but they don't know how to get there. So they're constantly iterating and adapting. And in fact, the way that they got there for say influencing healthcare policy during the Obama years is completely different um, from how they would influence healthcare policy during the Trump years. And so they're constantly having to adapt. Notice how different this is from the NIT strategy right below it where that kind of adaptation and innovation might actually be counterproductive for the ambulance service, where you want really tightly controlled protocols to do the same thing highly consistently with high quality control. Which finally takes us to the most complicated uh, and complex quadrant, um, where we don't understand cause and effect very well, but yet there's an attempt by organizations to increase their control over outcomes. Um, so this is what you might call an ecosystem strategy, um, what folks at FSG have sort of called collective um, impact, uh, what others talk about system level change. And here the challenge is in order to produce long-term outcomes, the challenge becomes actually orchestrating the work of multiple different actors towards a common set of goals. So those arrows depict different actors working on some piece of the problem, delivering a set of outputs that in combination can actually move the needle on the problem, which is outcomes. And so this is the, the four archetypal strategies. Um, and uh, I wanna spend a few minutes talking about a homeless serving organization that actually moved from a niche strategy, which was serving warm meals, to an ecosystem strategy, which was actually orchestrating the work of about 100 organizations to actually reduce and over time try to actually end chronic homelessness. Um, <clears throat> so here I've put up those images that I showed you earlier, each of which um, characterizes these four different strategies. Um, and I devote a chapter in the book to each of these uh, because they're archetypes that might have implications 
for the work of other kinds of organizations. Let me make a few sort of midpoint summary remarks here, um, and then we can we can maybe take a couple of questions uh, on sort of the four archetypes, or I can move on to talk about ecosystem strategy. The key point I want to make here is that strategy is a choice, and so it's not necessarily true that a particular intervention is a particular kind of strategy. A homeless serving organization can choose a need strategy or it can choose an ecosystem strategy. That depends on the goals as well as our understanding of cause and effect and control. Depending on the strategy chosen, it will require a different or a distinct internal system for performance measurement and accountability. And I make no judgment about the four quadrants. So it's possible to be high performing in any of those four quadrants. Um, but ultimately, one has to make uh, a series of choices. Um, Tanya, would this be a good moment to take a few questions on the four archetypes? Or would you prefer that I kind of move on to say a few words about the ecosystem strategy in particular? Actually, let's move on. And But I want to ask folks to, if you do have clarifying questions about the four strategic approaches, please put them in the Q&A box now and we'll start with those when we end with your presentation, Elnor, and then dig into the, the particulars around the ecosystem strategy. Okay, sounds great. So let me, let me uh, forge ahead. Uh, <clears throat> so I wanna talk about this organization in Washington DC called Miriam's Kitchen, um, who I've known for about 15 years. Um, and I've watched them go through this shift from a niche to an ecosystem strategy. So the original um, the Miriam's Kitchen um, was what you would expect from a soup kitchen. Um, it, was a, it was a neat strategy. And if you look at homeless services in DC, or for that matter, almost anywhere, you've got homeless individuals, um, and they're surrounded by a whole set of services. Um, and it's the meals and clothing one, sort of the one in the middle left, that Miriam's Kitchen um, was providing uh, ever since its founding. And that was pretty much all that it was doing. But there were all of these other types of services, right, around healthcare, substance abuse, mental health counseling, job training, and so on, including sort of temporary and long-term shelter. It was up to the client, to the homeless individual, to actually piece together all of these services. So they existed in different places, in different organizations. But imagine that if you're hard on your luck, or you have mental health challenges, you've got a substance abuse problem, how are you gonna piece all of this together? You could scale each of these things individually, you could reach more people, but is it actually going to address the longer term problem of homelessness? So the challenge here was all you could measure were those individual services. That's all your strategy actually allowed you to measure. So if you had a neat strategy, outputs were perfectly fine measures, but they weren't necessarily addressing the problem. So Malcolm Gladwell wrote a piece in the New Yorker um, over a dozen years ago called Million Dollar Murray. And he followed a homeless man that he called Murray. And he tried to tally up the cost to society of Murray. So if you added up the emergency room visits, the substance abuse treatment, interactions with emergency rooms and the police, Murray was costing society about $100,000 a year or about a million dollars a decade, right? Hence the name, Million Dollar Murray. And Glenn will ask the question, is there a better way? And he concluded, looking at what others had been doing, particularly in New York, that this could be done much more effectively at about a quarter of the price. Um, instead of all of these disaggregated mid services, there was an argument to be made for some sort of an ecosystem approach. The pioneer, sorry, the pioneering work in this was done by Pathways to Housing, Samson Barris in New York City. And they developed a model that I'll introduce briefly in just a moment. But I want to lay out the bigger picture first. The bigger picture is that this homelessness example is an illustration of what I think are four generalizable components of an ecosystem strategy. So it requires a system framing of the problem, an understanding of what that system looks like, 
it requires a social change model that actually recognizes the interdependence among constituent parts. It requires new capabilities in organizations for actually organizing and advocacy. And it requires accountability that's focused on collective outcomes rather than the individual pieces, which poses enormous challenges for attribution. And so, of course, there's all of this new work on contribution analysis, which turns out to be really important for this. So the overall, what this needs is a fundamental restructuring of the system, um, a capability for orchestration. And so we're looking at sort of backbone organizations, orchestration organizations. So, so let me take each of these four components briefly in turn, and I've got one slide on each of these. So I asked Miriam's Kitchen, um, their policy director, Adam Rocap at the time, to draw out for me their system. And he gave me a version of this sort of scribbled on paper that I then sort of converted into this slide. And we had a bit of back and forth on it. He counted about 102 organizations just in the Washington DC area that were working on some aspect of homelessness in Washington. I want to point your attention for the moment just to the three lightly colored orange boxes. Um, we tried to identify organizations that were supporting the infrastructure level work, helping the orchestration function. And we identified sort of three types of backbones. So on the bottom right is an evidence backbone. So here you've got housing and urban development, the work of community solutions, Roseanne Haggerty and her organization which really supports organizations like Miriam's in gathering and mapping data with respect to chronic and veteran homelessness, helping them develop advocacy strategies. On the top right is a policy backbone. These are organizations, both governmental and non-governmental, um, that are developing policies for addressing homelessness, do advocacy work in their own right. And then that orange box in the middle is the community backbone, which is much more localized where Miriam's Kitchen played a central role in bringing together a whole bunch of its partners, other network organizations in the DC area to actually push collective action towards addressing um, homelessness. But it required an understanding of what was already happening and Miriam's positioning, which is the two gray boxes within this broader system. So that's part one, system framing. Part two is, well, then can this lead to creating a social change model that recognizes interdependence? So instead of that fragmented niche series of niches, the model here was housing first or permanent supportive housing, um, which is now becoming much more widespread across the country. And the challenge here was not placing the onus on the client, but on the service providers to actually coordinate among themselves. If you could do that, what would you measure? You would not only measure the quality of services, the outputs for each of these service providers, but now all of a sudden you could measure collective outcomes. Um, and that footnote suggests one of the early studies showed that people that went through the housing first model, um, housing retention, one of the key outcome measures was 88% of people placed in housing as compared to the old model where it was only um, about 47%. The challenge of course here is that you've got weak attribution, right? You can see sort of collectively the needle moving on the problem, um, but you can't attribute it to any single intervention. The third component which Miriam's and others needed to develop was a capability for organizing. So there's a funnel, not all homeless individuals are the same you could segment them into these three categories, a vulnerable category that needs permanent supportive housing, a less vulnerable category that can be rapidly rehoused, and then an even less vulnerable category that could benefit from sort of one-time financial assistance. And then you could wrap around all of these customized services uh, much more efficiently to serve those needs. So part A of that organizing was, could you develop a measurement instrument to assess vulnerability that everyone would use to then segment this client market. 
But even if you could deliver or uh, build that vulnerability assessment, which it turned out actually was already in the works by other organizations, you would actually then have to go out and assess every homeless client. So there was a massive undertaking to actually do that. So in 2016, um, sort of the annual, there's an annual count in January across the country of homeless people in a single night. The estimate for Washington DC was about 8,000 people. So Miriam's organized with others to apply this vulnerability assessment tool to every single homeless individual in Washington DC. So imagine this task, training about 800 staff from 102 agencies to consistently apply this common assessment tool. They completed over 12,000 unique surveys, which you notice is a number that's about 50% bigger than the original tally of homeless individuals, which suggests that the original tally was a severe undercount, and even the 12,000 might be an undercount. But you've got some real data there in a shared database. You can segment the market. You can now lobby City Hall, so another capability required for advocacy to actually now lobby for money for permanent supportive housing. And if you could place people in housing, then you could wrap around these customized services um, to them. Which then enables you to get to the fourth piece, which is accountability for collective outcomes. So this is the segmentation um, on that vulnerability index. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of push ahead here. But you see that that sort of those blue bars, which on the right-hand side is depicted in the pie chart, this is the percentage, 51% of the people surveyed, of the 12,000 people surveyed, were identified as highly vulnerable and thus eligible for permanent supportive housing, which meant that all of a sudden you needed to find 6,000 um, placements in terms of housing and housing availability. So you needed to lobby for that amount of space, not only City Hall, but housing developers and housing owners. So if you were to look at trends in terms of homeless numbers in the Washington DC area um, over this 10 year period from 2007 to 16, you see sort of the top line homeless individuals, the dashed line has stayed pretty much the same because there's this, even if you're placing people out of homelessness, there's an inflow. You see the, the dotted line, people in families, is actually going up. This is true in DC, this is true in Hawaii, this is true in New York. But if you look at the two categories that Miriam's Kitchen focused on and galvanized others to focus on, chronically homeless individuals and military veterans, those are trending downwards. Is it because of Miriam's Kitchen alone? Obviously not. Um, is it because of the collective work of all of these other players? Possibly. So there's a contribution analysis argument to be made here rather than an attribution argument. So to wrap up kind of the four high level components of an ecosystem strategy is being able to see this system of a hundred or so players in this instance, being able to identify an interdependent social change model, permanent supportive housing or housing first in this instance, being able to build capabilities for organizing, um, not only organizing other players in the system, but also for lobbying City Hall. And then finally, having a set of collective outcomes that one holds one's own feet to the fire for. So that brings us back to sort of these four strategic archetypes of which I've spent some time talking about an ecosystem strategy. So let me stop there um, and let's open it up. Excellent. Thank you, Elnor, very much. And um, I want to encourage folks to add their questions to the Q&A section as we go. Um, we have a couple already, and I'd also like to close one just to get us to kick us off. Um, so one of the things that we've observed in our work with foundations who are trying to uh, develop effective performance management systems or measurement systems uh, is that, uh, and actually Avery just posted a question that relates to this, uh, is that there's a, there is oftentimes a gap between the amount of time and human resources and 
kind of carrying capacity that an organization has to even think about developing a performance management system and the level of complicatedness, right, of the strategy that they're trying to build one for. And when you layer in for foundations, the fact that the sort of execution of the work is happening at the grantee level and grantees all then are accountable for or responsible for developing their own uh, or reporting against their own sort of performance measures, sometimes built in collaboration with foundations and sometimes not. Uh, what often happens is people default back to a very thin, uh, simple uh, format for performance management that reflects more of that bottom left quadrant than it does the top right. Not necessarily because of a conceptual mismatch, but because of a capacity mismatch. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the things that we we hear from organizations, uh, grantee organizations in particular, is and foundation evaluation directors, is that that this can often kind of cause harm because it reverts back to a form or a system of accountability that incentivizes the wrong behaviors. Um, and so, what that makes us wonder about is how, what cautions do you have as folks are trying to make the appropriate match between a measurement system and the nature of the strategy? Do you have any cautions or words of wisdom about the, the potential harm or the what happens when there's a mismatch and what trade-offs should people should be willing to make as they struggle with this capacity challenge? Yeah, um, wonderful and really hard question. Um, that I think we're all struggling with. Um, you know, a, a couple of initial reflections, and I'd love to hear sort of others' perspectives and experience on this. Um, I, I don't think, I, I, I do think it's important to keep things simple. Um, and by simple, I don't mean simplistic. Um, and part of what I've tried to do in this book is you know, for each of these strategies, I devote sort of a case study to each. And in the case studies, I was really interested in doing a pretty deep dive on what does this look like inside the organization? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and, and particularly in sort of the emergent and the ecosystem strategy components, there's, it would be very easy for this whole thing to blow up in a way that is so complicated in terms of the numbers of indicators, how they connect, um, that it would be a heavily burdensome task for people to both collect that data and to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to keep things as clear and simple as possible, as obvious as that sounds, um, turns out to be part of the real yeah. challenge. Um, and so, so the way that Miriam's Kitchen and some of its partners have approached this is, you know, Miriam's, so Miriam's view is, it plays both a niche and an ecosystem role. So on the niche piece where it's sort of serving meals, it's providing clothing, it's doing some case management, it's very clear that it's gonna measure outputs and it's gonna identify a small number, a handful of outputs, um, and it's gonna put quality criteria on those. Mm. And those it can do, right? So the case management team can actually measure those itself. The meal services team can measure those itself. And it's not a heavy lift in terms of measurement. On sort of the ecosystem strategy piece, they've been clear about a couple of things. One is they want to keep the eye on the ball of rates of homelessness and retention in permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. Those are things that actually, you know, rate sort of the numbers of chronic homeless, Miriam's Kitchen doesn't actually have to measure. These are data that the city, uh, city provides, um, that uh, community solutions uh, sort of helps map out. And so there's no sort of effort on Miriam's Kitchen's part to actually collect that data. But it's important for Miriam's Kitchen to look at that and to have it front and center. And so they look at that quarterly or even monthly. So they're keeping track of what's happening. And if there's an upward or a downward trend, then they can ask the question, well, why do we think this is happening? And they can develop hypotheses for why they think it's happening. So then they can figure out how to intervene. Um, in terms of, um, retention in housing, um, if they find that sort of retention among the chronically homeless that are placed in permanent supportive housing is staying at about 90, 95%, then they know that it's working pretty well. If it's beginning to fall and that retention rate turns out not to be hard to track, 
if it's beginning to fall, then you would need to kick in a process to ask the question, well, why is it falling? Is it falling in certain places? And could we contract an evaluator to help us figure this out? Mm -hmm. But the evaluation questions are driven by business decisions, by social change decisions. The other thing I want to say about this is, um, you know, there's, there's the emergence of all of these um, sort of methodologies recently, um, you know, lean data. So, so Acumen and Impact Investors sort of developed this lean data methodology, which is now hived off into a standalone enterprise called 60 Decibels. And kind of full disclosure, I was involved um, as an advisor to them. Um, and we sort of co-authored a piece on lean data in the Stanford Social Innovation Review that laid out the process. What I, what I love about their work is um, the premise is very simple. And it's asking managers inside organizations, if there was one question that you wanted, that you would like an answer to today that would help you do your job better, what is that one question? Mm. So it's driven by operational issues. But typically, it's got a connection to long-term results. Mm. And then the challenge for, for the lean data folks or for an evaluator is then to say, okay, given that question, how could I answer it in a robust way, but that's also quick enough to feed it back into decision-making in the organization? Mm -hmm. And so sort of on the monitoring and evaluation sort of time frame, this is not an evaluation question. This is a monitoring question. Yeah because it's sort of short-term feedback. So the lean data work, the constituent voice work that Keystone Accountability does um, is all sort of within sort of that, that perspective. And so, so the, to kind of provide a short answer to that long-winded answer is, I think it's important to clarify the question that's relevant for managerial decision-making today. And that will help sort of keep focus. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, point. And I, it makes me think of, I'm hoping everyone else can see the, colleague, the questions your colleagues are posing because they're all rich and we won't be able to get to all of them. But um, I, this actually takes me to Tom's question, Tom's Kelly, Tom Kelly's question about, uh, uh, and I'm, pardon me, Tom, while I, while I paraphrase and maybe misinterpret, but um, Tom, Tom's, Tom's question is about where, there, are we seeing more often sort of a mismatch between performance measurement expectations and the nature of the strategy, right, where they've, they've done a poor match and so the data turn out to not be particularly useful for that piece? Or is there a larger accountability structure problem a lot when it comes to the performance management system? And, I, and what your response just then made me think that um, I want to articulate what I think that the latter piece means, where we see many performance management systems actually being implemented in foundations for the purpose of reassuring the board, uh, which loses the connection to the managerial decision-making imperative, mm -hmm. right? So, so all of that energy gets spent on producing a set of data to make a board feel good about what, where things are going. And uh, at the end of the day, then no one really has the data they need to make any of those decisions. So I feel like that represents a pretty big mindset shift in the philanthropic sector around what, who the audience for performance management work and measurement work actually is. That we maybe have lost, we've tried to conflate that sort of board accountability with the managerial accountability work. Yeah, um, indeed. It's, um, I think it is both both of those challenges that Tom articulated. So on one side, there is a mismatch, but there is a bigger challenge. Um, the, the bigger challenge, to kind of bring it back to the perspective of, of managers and leaders inside organizations, is a multiple accountability problem, right? And I think, you know, one can't underestimate sort of how difficult this challenge is, um, mm -hmm. where any leader in an organization is constantly I've seen it so many times, just constantly pulled in so many different directions um, by sort of internally the expectations of their own staff, but then the expectations of a whole range of funders who then have sort of the expectations of their boards. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, the very different sometimes expectations of clients or beneficiaries, they're not all the same. Mm 
And so you've got sort of these multiple accountability directions, right? All arrows pulling in all different directions at once. And um, I've never seen an organization that has been able to satisfy mm -hmm. all accountability expectations. But what I have seen is the rare organization that says, I'm going to prioritize my accountability in this way, and then they're explicit about it. And as a result, while these other things are important, I'm not going to pay attention to them. Mm. And so they're explicit that's about powerful. it. That's powerful. Yeah, that's, and it's, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, again, it's a strategic choice, and it's a task of leadership. And I don't see how one can get past this without being very explicit in that sense. Mm. And it's a, it, it enables accountability because you're explicit then about not only what you're accountable for, but you're, you're, you're also explicit about what you're not going to be accountable for and why. And, and, and in the organizations where I've seen managers sort of take that leap, I've also found their funders willing to go there with them, ah. quite to their own surprise. Interesting. And so I think there's actually an openness to that kind of a conversation, which, um, which I think people are afraid of, but actually it turns out to be, in, in many instances, quite, quite uh, manageable. The other piece of this kind of the mismatch of, of performance uh, measurement uh, systems with what's actually needed for the strategy, uh, that I think is probably the norm. I see it all the time. Mm. Um, and it comes through, so in my book where it's especially obvious is in my chapter on integrated strategy, mm. which, where, where I look at this agricultural development organization in India. Um, and I've known them for about 25 years. I'd done some research on them for my first book um, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then I revisited them a couple of years ago. Um, and they had gone through this big shift in their funding environment. So in the 90s, they had huge amounts of bilateral aid. So they were getting money from the European Commission, the Canadian government, um, some foundations, Ford Foundation, um, USAID. Uh, but most of it was European Commission money. So they had like 15 million bucks over several years. Um, and they had largely sort of uh, one set of reporting requirements. And they developed a whole database where they were reporting on all of this stuff. Um, and you know, when I, when I did that early work, it was very clear, and they were, to their credit, very open about this. They were collecting all of that data for production for that external environment. Um, and it was reported out in English rather than in the local language of Gujarati. Um, and it was barely used for internal decision making. So real mismatch as a result of the funding environment. Um, fast forward almost a generation later, um, all of that bilateral funding has dried up. They've got about 40 different corporate funders now. Um, and so, you know, corporations, corporate social responsibility, all of this, and each corporation has a different expectation, right? And so now they're beginning to feel the pressure on that. Um, they can't satisfy everybody. So they're turning inward in a positive way. And the inward reaction is, we need to be clear about what matters to us in terms of achieving our goals. Mm. And then we need to be clear about communicating that to the funders. So they're finally sort of 25 years in, beginning to clarify, sort of deal with that mismatch and actually align their performance measurement systems with their strategy. They're not there yet, but it's been a very painful process to actually see that and to work their way through it. Um, and you know, I, I have incredible admiration for them that they've actually shared that story in That's the amazing. book um, wow. to inspire others. The, uh, it relates to in the just couple of minutes we have left because I'm I'm there are some uh, really rich questions in this uh, feed here that I think we should bring back in in some other way but I want to just link uh, a question from Nuando Abele the Third Sector New England and back to Avery's question about um, who decides on what questions matter uh, and whose performance needs to shift or like who's who's making those choices and um that story that just shared and and the idea that uh funders if we're serious about this a measurement approaches mattering for performance how well people do out in the field there's got to be some kind of shift in the way 
who is the source of, of what measures are important and who gets to make that decision. So I'm wondering if you could close us out. Um, it's this going to be hard to do in two minutes, but uh, given your, you've described the ecosystem strategy in particular, where funders are often imagining themselves in a role of a, of a big orchestrator. Uh, but, but actually there are a lot of independent actors with agency moving, trying to sort of move together. Can you just say a few words of advice about in that sort of ecosystem strategy with where you have all of these independent agents, what do funders need to be prepared for, really mindful of as they think about how they approach performance measurement given questions of both equity and independence and agency and all of these now multiple needs for who's making decisions about performing in what way and at what level? Yeah. Um, you know, it's the question in a sense, sort of the funder's role as possible orchestrator um, is at a structural level actually quite similar to the question of say a nonprofit like Miriam's Kitchen as an orchestrator, right? So Miriam's needs to pay attention to its constituents both the, the homeless clients it works for as well as others in its ecosystem. Um, and sort of those accountability questions loom large for it in terms of who is it primarily accountable for and what are the, how does it frame its work um, and the questions of measurement in relationship to those. And so then one can sort of move up the ecosystem and say, well, funders need to ask those same set of questions. Um, I think the, the most important thing from my perspective um, is for whether it's Miriam's Kitchen or whether it's a funder to be very explicit about their strategy and on what basis they've arrived at that strategy. Um, so, you know, you can imagine, let me give you two different directions for this, but there's many different directions one could go. So at one level, you could imagine a funder that says, um, you know, and I'm thinking actually of the Robin Hood Foundation in New York as an example of this. And I talk about them in the last chapter of this book, which is on the roles of funders. Um, so the Robin Hood Foundation, you know, they give about 200 grants um, and a, a year, and they're focused on poverty in New York City. Um, and they, one of their criteria for grant allocation is they do kind of a benefit cost analysis, right? And they have sort of benefit cost ratios for their, you know, for their portfolios. Um, and some people love this because they say, well, you're sort of being systematic about how you're articulating and quantifying benefits, yeah. um, as well as the costs of delivering that. Um, and others just feel like this is creepy, right? That this is just, you can't actually quantify this way. There's all sorts of problems with it. Um, regardless of how you feel about it, they're explicit about how they go about it. Uh. And they make that methodology explicit on their website. Interesting. And they've got a document that lays out sort of, I don't know, 50 or 100 different benefit cost analyses that they've done. Mm -hmm. And when they decide to continue or start funding an organization, this is one of the inputs that goes into the decision making. And their board looks at sort of these benefit cost ratios for 50 organizations every quarter. So they look at this for 200. Whether you like it or not, they're explicit about it in a way that can reasonably be challenged and questioned. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I think the first thing is to actually be transparent, be explicit, share your reasoning, your logic, so that it can be improved and challenged. Nice. Um, and then the final thing that I want to say about that is think about another way in which one might do this. Another way might be to say, well, rather than sort of funding 200 organizations that have the best benefit cost ratios, what if you picked a problem? in the way that Miriam's Kitchen picked chronic homelessness. What if you picked a problem that you care about that's driven by your values as a foundation? Um, and then you said, I'm gonna look at who's doing this work, um, but I'm not just gonna, I'm gonna develop a theory of change of my own. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a ecosystem type strategy, um, but that's not gonna be populated just by the best players. I'm gonna look for gaps within the ecosystem without which this problem can't be solved. Mm. I'm gonna look for organizations that are actually rather weak, but they occupy an important position with an important niche within that ecosystem. And I'm gonna invest in strengthening them. And so then all of a sudden, the foundation becomes truly an orchestrator where it's got a clear strategy around a problem, 
but its funding varies based on helping certain well-established organizations with proven model scale, strengthening others, creating new niches in others. Mm -hmm. But it's, it only makes sense if there's a clear strategy in place mm -hmm. so that everybody understands the basis for that decision making. Um, and I, it's rare, I think, to see that kind of strategic transparency at the foundation level. There's Elnor, I, we are, we are at the end of our time together and I, uh, I am personally frustrated because I think we could talk about this for five more hours, <laughs> at least. Uh, I want to thank you and, and say to everybody who's joined us, we have the questions saved in the questions that you've posed to each other that um, we'd like to capture and engage on. And there is a Slack channel for folks who are members of the evaluation roundtable. Um, and we'd like to continue the conversation there, but also you've offered a set of resources we will share on the website along with the, the um, recording of this webinar. Uh, what I hope everybody takes away from this, or at least what I've taken away from this is, is uh, well, several smaller points, more specific points, but the big picture for me is, um, goes back actually to the very first quote you opened with um, from Onora O'Neill about, really thinking about more intelligent forms of accountability that where we can actually see that our approaches drive performance and effectiveness instead of falling into the compliance trap. And um, we hope that we will, uh, we hope this conversation will continue because we, we sense that there is an awful lot of time and energy spent on performance measurement in the philanthropic sector. Um, without quite so much return on actual improvements in performance. And so you've given us a way to think about how to improve both the match and to think about accountability and in a way that might actually help get us there and make those resources uh, actually have value for the folks who are trying to make change. So I wanna thank you so much for being willing to, uh, to do this with us. And um, everybody, we will send out a link to all of you, to the webinar itself, as well as to the resources that Elnor has assembled for us. And uh, thank you so much for the time you've given and we will send out these questions as well. Thanks so much, wonderful. Thanks day. everybody, have a good day.